Jupiter has 95 moons, including one so massive it's larger than Mercury. Now imagine all of them, every last one, suddenly orbiting Earth. The sky is beautiful, but the question is, can we survive our new neighbors? Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, a swirling giant of gas and gravity. It outweighs everything else orbiting the sun combined, and it's so massive, its center of gravity with the sun isn't even inside the sun. That's how you know it means business. And like any proper heavyweight, Jupiter rolls deep with an entourage of 95 moons. Some are barely there. Tiny chunks of ice and rock like S-2010J2, just two kilometers wide. Others, absolute units. Ganymede is the largest moon in the entire solar system. At over 5,200 kilometers across, it's bigger than Mercury, one and a half times the size of our moon, and twice as heavy. You could land a country on it, maybe two if they get along. Jupiter keeps all of this in check thanks to its colossal gravity, strong enough to hold this moon swarm in perfect balance 778 million kilometers from the sun. That is five times farther than Earth, and just far enough to stay out of our way. Until now. So, we swap Earth's moon for all 95 of Jupiter's moons. Now, most are small, under 10 kilometers wide. To you, they would look like unusually bright stars. A little weird, but not terrifying. Then, the big four show up. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Massive, icy, volcanic moons. Ganymede alone would appear several times larger than our current moon. Suddenly, your night sky isn't peaceful. It's crowded. And that's just the beginning. Of all Jupiter's moons, Europa might be the one that feels oddly familiar. At 3,100 kilometers wide, it's pretty close in size to our moon, about 90% the same. From a distance, you might not even notice the difference. But then it shines. Europa's surface is a shell of almost pristine ice, smooth and freshly paved by geologic time. It reflects 64% of the sunlight that hits it, and our moon, just 12%. So, when Europa rises, it doesn't just glow, it glares, over five times brighter than a full moon that we would normally see on Earth, enough to cast shadows sharp enough to read by. It's over five times brighter than the full moon you're used to, the kind of light that casts razor-sharp shadows. I hope you didn't enjoy stargazing, because the sky is washed out. Apart from making astrologers lose their minds and identities, it's actually disruptive. Nocturnal animals would struggle, circadian rhythms would shift, entire ecosystems used to true darkness would need to adapt or disappear. It would feel like you're sleeping under a stadium floodlight. And then there's Ganymede, the heavyweight champion of moons. At 5,268 kilometers wide, it's larger than Mercury and twice the mass of our moon. And now, it's orbiting Earth. But all that mass comes with a price. Gravity. Ganymede's pull would supercharge Earth's tides, dragging oceans into towering surges. Ocean swells turn into walls, shorelines vanish. If you live anywhere near sea level, the beach is no longer a place you visit. It's what shows up at your front door twice a day. But tides are only the beginning. The gravitational tug of war between Ganymede and Earth's interior would stretch and squeeze the planet. The result? Massive earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, fault lines popping up in places we thought were safe. And the longer Ganymede stays, the more it tears things apart. Earth's crust wasn't built for this. And neither were you. Of all Jupiter's moons, Io is the most dangerous to bring home. Not because it's volcanic, though it is constantly erupting, but because of what it brings with it. Radiation. Orbiting deep inside Jupiter's magnetosphere, Io is blasted with charged particles, 
Radiation levels near it can reach 3,600 rem per day. That's thousands of times the lethal dose for a human. And if IO brings even a fraction of that radioactive storm with it, well, we've just created a new kind of threat. Invisible belts of charged particles circling Earth. Not visible, not loud, just there. Invisible arcs of ionized death orbiting silently. Lethal to satellites, astronauts, and possibly even high altitude flights. Earth's orbit becomes a minefield. Satellites flicker out one by one, phones stop working, and you have to speak to a human instead of doom scrolling through TikTok. And you can forget about SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, or space exploration in general because, well, no one's going up there anytime soon. Not safely anyway. We didn't just bring a moon, we brought a radiation trap. And Jupiter doesn't just have gravity, it has the largest magnetosphere in the entire solar system. Its moons, especially Europa, Ganymede, and Io, evolved inside that protective field, bathed in electromagnetic shielding, charged particle flows, complex magnetic interactions. But now, they're in Earth's orbit, and Earth's magnetic field is not Jupiter's. It's like trading a bunker for an umbrella. With that shielding gone, Europa and Ganymede both thought to hide subsurface oceans may begin to cool or destabilize, their delicate balance of heat and chemistry disrupted by Earth's weaker field. Io, the most volcanically active body in the solar system, owes much of its fury to tidal heating and electromagnetic induction from Jupiter's magnetic embrace. But here, that induction weakens. The lava might still bubble, but the fireworks slow. Earth doesn't get off clean though. With multiple large moons orbiting, their gravitational tugs and orbital interactions could subtly disrupt our own magnetic field, nudging it off balance, weakening our already thin shield against solar radiation and cosmic particles. It wouldn't be immediate or dramatic, just a slow, silent thinning of the planet's defenses. As if tsunamis, radiation, and magnetic chaos weren't enough, Ganymede has one more trick. Tidal locking. With its immense mass and persistent gravitational pull, Ganymede could, over time, tidally lock Earth. Meaning, one side of the planet would always face the moon. Half of the planet, stuck in eternal sunlight, roasting under a sun that never sets. The other half? plunged into freezing darkness, colder than any winter we've ever known. Not all consequences are catastrophic though. Ganymede does have one surprising benefit, which is climate stability. Earth's tilt, the reason that we have seasons, wobbles slightly over time, shifting between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees every 41,000 years. But a massive moon like Ganymede could act like a gravitational anchor, keeping our tilt steadier and our climate calmer. That wobble drives long-term climate cycles, including ice ages. The result would be less extreme seasonal swings, more predictable climate patterns, and most notably, no more future ice ages. You might not hate wearing shorts in February. So yes, we broke the tides. Yes, we might have irritated the atmosphere, but at least we stabilized the weather silver linings, if you survive long enough to enjoy them. What would the actual impact be on humans? In the US, where 40% of the population lives near coastlines, over 127 million people would face displacement. Cities like New York, Miami, and New Orleans, they're either submerged or unlivable from daily tidal surges. Across the Atlantic, the UK suffers a similar fate. The Thames Barrier, designed for rare floods, now sees high tide as a regular visitor. London, Liverpool, parts of Wales and Scotland would have their infrastructure overwhelmed. The small island nations, well, they'd get wiped off the map completely. The Maldives, Tuvalu, Kiribati, entire cultures drowned. Not by war or time, but by a moon that didn't belong. You watch it unfold from your rooftop, then your roof starts to float. Inland, things aren't much better. Earthquakes, volcanic activity, billions affected. But 
the disruptions may not all be physical. Time has always been a bit flimsy, more habit than truth, and 95 moons are more than enough to break it. Our calendar was built around one moon, a clean 29 and a half day cycle, predictable and steady. Now, every moon has its own orbit, its own rhythm, some fast, some slow, none of them in sync. The idea of a month starts to fall apart. Do we keep track of each one, try to celebrate Ganymede Day every third Europa orbit? At some point, it just stops making sense. And that's not even the worst of it. Earth's rotation is already slowing, pulled gradually by the moon's gravity. Over billions of years, we'd expect longer days, maybe 30 hours eventually. But with dozens of new moons tugging from every angle, that timeline speeds up. The days start to stretch, sunsets drag on, sunrise loses its slot, and bit by bit, we lose our most basic rhythm, the simple beat of light and dark. How do you measure a day when the sky never looks the same twice? Something strange might happen, equal parts beautiful and terrifying. Earth could end up with rings. With 95 moons crammed into orbit, collisions aren't just possible, they're guaranteed. The aftermath? Debris. Dust, ice, shattered rock, spreading into glowing bands that hang just above the atmosphere. A shimmering halo. It would be breathtaking, but also short-lived. Saturn's been wearing rings for millions of years, but it's built for it. And Earth, it isn't. Our gravity is much weaker, and the sun's pull, far stronger. Some of those moons might drift outward, stolen by solar tides. Others could spiral inward, fast. You may see a stunning moon shower, and then the show's over. Like, really over. So while adding 95 moons might be visually stunning, it would reshape our planet. Tides, climate, tectonics, even time itself, all thrown into chaos. Earth's delicate balance depends on simplicity, and sometimes one moon is exactly enough. And hey, if you learned something or just enjoyed watching Earth get wrecked, go ahead and like, subscribe, and drop a comment down below to let us know. Which moon would you keep if you had to pick just one?